realizing my glasses are. Yeah. All right. Ready? Yep. Good evening, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Coming at you for another one of our live programs here on the National Museum of Civil War Medicine Facebook page. I'm joined this evening by my good friend and historian, Ryan Quint. Hey, Ryan, how you doing today? Doing all right, Jake, how are you? Doing great, it's great to have you finally here on our yeah. Facebook page and eventually on our YouTube channel as well. Hello to all of you out there on the interwebs. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July Independence Day. And we are excited to be back here after the 4th of July and after our second weekend of being open to the public. Yes, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is open again. We are open on weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can come visit us from 10 to 5 on Friday and Saturday and 11 to 5 on Sundays. If you're interested in finding out more information about coming and visiting the museum, you can go to our website, civilwarmed.org. You can find information there. You can also find information about our reopening plan right here on Facebook and on YouTube as well. So check out those sources of information if you want to know more about coming to visit us. If you want to support these videos, you can do that. You can help us out by going and liking this video, sharing this video with your friends, by going to our Facebook page, YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter, wherever we are on the internet, you can go and follow us and you can learn more about Civil War Medicine, uh, you can find out more about the museum. And we hope you all will come and visit us. And even better, if you want to take your support to the next level, you can become a member or a donor for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You can find information about that over in the comments section in just a bit. I'll be putting a link in there. You can also find it on our website, civilwarmed.org slash support. We've gotten a lot of support over the last couple of months during this pandemic where we've been closed to the public. So many of you have donated, supported by becoming a member. If you've enjoyed these videos, you enjoy these conversations, you want to support the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, please consider becoming a donor or becoming a member and you directly support programs like this one. Tonight we are talking about the Battle of Monocacy and Ryan is one of the experts on this battle. Uh, there are experts out there on this battle, or I would say, would you say Ryan, few and far between? It's not yeah, a battle yeah. that uh, has uh, gotten a super amount of interest compared to say other battles in the region like Antietam and Gettysburg, but Ryan is the perfect person to talk to to show why the Battle of Monocacy on July 9th, 1864 is incredibly important. It takes place right outside the city of Frederick. This battle, if you didn't haven't heard of it yet, you're gonna learn all about it tonight and you're gonna find out why this is one of the most important battles you've never heard of. So Ryan, can you introduce us to yourself? Tell us a little about who Ryan Quint is and how you got interested in this little battle near Frederick. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks again for having me, Jake. Um, yeah, I thought it was funny. You know, the Monocacy fan club is, is small, but it's growing, which I'm glad to see. Um, I got interested in the Battle of Monocacy when I worked as an intern at the National Park Service in Fredericksburg and back in 2013. And as an intern, I was talking about Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania and Chancellorsville and the wilderness. And the thing is that these battles are massive and huge and, and of course they're important, but I wanted something a little bit smaller to, to read about and kind of wrap my, around, my, my mind around. So I started looking at Monocacy. Uh, I read Glenn Worthington's book. We'll talk more about Glenn Worthington later. Uh, but I read Glenn Worthington's, Glenn Worthington's book, Fighting for Time, and was basically immediately hooked. Um, and that started a, a long road that culminated in 2017 with the publication of my book, uh, Determined to Stand and Fight by Ta Savas Beatty, which is part of the Emerging Civil War series. Uh, and the Emerging Civil War series uh, is kind of a bird's eye view of the battle. Uh, it allows people who don't really know much about battles to have a quick reference um, and so I'm pretty happy with what came out and um, here we are now uh, so still working in public history still enjoying it still enjoying talking to all kinds of people about all kinds of different stuff so here we are 
Yeah, the, the book is, it's a wonderful, wonderful read. If you are interested in the book, I'm going to be putting a link into the comment section uh, where you can email our store manager. We do sell the book, uh, Ryan's book on the Battle of Monocacy at the museum. So if you want to support the museum, that's another way you can do it is by purchasing the book through the museum. So you'll see the store manager's email over there in just a second. You can send her a note. Her name is Trish. She is wonderful. You can send her a note and uh, we can get that book shipped out to you. So Ryan, I think before we really dive into the battle itself and of course the medical aspects, which is we are the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So of course we're gonna talk about the medical aspect. And, and that was a section of the book that I, thank you, Ryan, very much for the opportunity to write the medical section, the appendix to, uh, to this book. So before we get to, to that, and I'll, I'll give a brief kind of medical overview of where we are in 1864, Tell us about how we get to Monocacy. How do, how do we get to the Battle of Monocacy in July of 1864? What's the situation like? What, what's going on? Okay, yeah, sure. To do that, I've got any any map. So I'm going to share my screen for just a second um, and talk about it. So here we have a map uh, of really the, the Eastern Theater in, in the summer of 1864. And I think you can see my cursor. Is that true? Yeah, you can yes, see my cursor. Can see your cursor. Okay. So let's start in the spring of 1864, with what's called the Overland Campaign. The Overland Campaign between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia uh, sees the battles of the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, um, North Anna River, Totopotomy Creek, Cold Harbor. And what you're seeing happening are these massive armies colliding into each other throughout the spring of 1864 as General-in-Chief of the United States Army, Ulysses S. Grant, is attempting to grind his way towards Richmond and destroy the Confederate Army in the process. However, that is just one small part of the plan, because as Grant's overall plan was to put pressure on all parts of the line, while the Overland Campaign is here, secondary thrusts were moving up the Shenandoah Valley um, with the ultimate goal of Lynchburg here, and you can see why all these different railroads here. The initial push up the valley is defeated uh, in the Battle of Newmarket. Uh, that's Franz Siegel and the BMI cadets and all of that. A secondary push is launched a little while later in the command of David Hunter. And, and Union General David Hunter, again, moving up the valley, again, moving towards Lynchburg. It's absolutely pivotal for Confederate forces to hold Lynchburg, again, because of the railroad here. And so while Robert E. Lee was starting to get hemmed in around Richmond, he made the ultimate decision to send about a quarter of his army, about 15,000 men linking up uh, west from Richmond to secure the city of Lynchburg. Those Confederate forces were commanded by Jubal Early. Jubal Early goes to Lynchburg, arrives, and defeats David Hunter at the two-day-long Battle of Lynchburg, and Hunter will retreat to the left of the map into the Kanawha Valley of West Virginia. And when David Hunter and his Union forces retreat into West Virginia, that leaves the entire Shenandoah Valley open. At this point, it's late June, and Jubal Early makes the move, makes the decision to move north, moving again, what's called down the valley. So as he moves north, he'll go uh, to Lexington, he'll go to Stanton, and then again, making his way down the valley towards the Potomac River. He writes in late June that he's moving uh, on Washington, in fact, Washington, D.C., with the intention of threatening it, and if possible, to capture it. And we can talk about the feasibility of such plans if we want. That's his goal. Move on Washington and threaten the city. The plan is if we, if we scare Ulysses S. Grant into sending reinforcements away from Richmond and away from Petersburg, Lee might be able to break out of that place. And the fact that here we are in July, the election's coming up, right? We don't know anything about that today. But the election is coming up. And so if they can put pressure on Abraham Lincoln, then the growing peace platform in, in North who were already tired of war, might sue for peace. So in early July, Jubal Early will start to try to attack Harper's Ferry here at the confluence of the Potomac and the Shenandoah Rivers. And the ultimate plan here is to move down the Potomac River and straight into Washington. He is stymied there by Union forces. And so Early makes a decision to hop north again to the South Mountain, the Catoctin Mountain Passes, move down into the Frederick City Valley, and then move on Washington that way. Union forces are scrambling to cover themselves. Union soldiers are spread all over the map. And it's going to be the responsibility of a man named Lew Wallace in Baltimore, 
to marshal those forces. Wallace, of course, is famous for writing Ben-Hur years later. Uh, but here in 1864, he's a major general of volunteers. And by July 9th, the day of the battle, he's marshaled about 6,500 soldiers. Uh, one division of the 6th Army Corps who have been sent via steamship to Baltimore and then via rail, uh, one division. Uh, and then the rest are 100-day militia units um, and some Potomac Home Brigade units. So there is a wide mixture of experienced and inexperienced troops under Lew Wallace's command. And he makes the decision to fight behind the Monocacy River, use the river as a natural barrier and make Jubal Early come to him. As part of those preparations is to evacuate Frederick of its supplies, including medical supplies, because there were a number of general hospitals in the area that had been uh, treating wounded and sick and ailing Union soldiers. And so Wallace is trying to secure those assets, send them out via rail uh, to Baltimore or to Washington, while simultaneously getting ready for this fight that will begin on July 9th, 1864. So perhaps if we're talking about the evacuation of medical supplies, Jake, we can turn it back over to you and talk a little bit about medical uh, care in general. Uh, so I will stop the map there. Excellent. And go, go from there. So that's, right. that's the situation. Yes, yeah, so the situation is super tenuous. There is a lot of drama just waiting there for you know, people are watching what's going on in the Shenandoah Valley and then into Maryland in 1864 as it is appearing that Confederate forces are about to make a march on Washington. Lew Wallace is going to make a stand. So with that all being said, and we've set the stage now for the Battle of Monocacy, I do want to take just a quick second to talk about where medicine's at in 1864. So we have seen incredible evolution since 1861 of battlefield medical care. Since 1861, we've seen both armies ramp up their military medical evacuation systems. Medical care is better on the battlefield. There is crude forms of triage being utilized. They're sorting who's getting treated first. The medical professionals who are on the battlefield are incredibly experienced by this point, especially in 1864. Uh, Ryan and I often talk about 1864. He's an interested in monocacy. I'm interested in a lot of the events happening between Washington and Richmond in the spring of 1864. 1864 is the bloodiest year of the war. We think of 1863, you think of Gettysburg, and you're thinking of Chickamauga. The bloodiest battles of the war take place in 1863. But 1864 is bloodier. It's you know, there are more soldiers being wounded. The battles are, have become more vicious and are occurring day after day after day in a way they hadn't before. And so these surgeons, the nurses, the battlefield attendants have far more experience than they did in 1861 or 62 or 63. All of that experience is adding up, meaning that medical treatment on the battlefield is going to be far better than it was at earlier stages in the conflict. We also have systems in place, and this is for those of you that have seen my programs in the past or seen our other videos, we talk a lot about Jonathan Letterman. Jonathan Letterman with the Army of the Potomac, he's gone. He's, he's back in Pennsylvania uh, doing some hospital inspections in the Department of the Susquehanna. He is no longer with the Army of the Potomac. He is no longer with the U.S. Army in, the field of, in these fields of combat. But the system that he created, what we call today the Letterman Plan, this is the idea of from the moment a soldier is wounded on the battlefield, there is someone there to care for them. From the field dressing station, right there, 200 yards from the battlefield, where they're putting on tourniquets, they are preparing the wounded for transport, put them onto stretchers, uh, train stretcher bear teams out on the battlefield, bringing men off the field, ambulances out there on the battlefield, bringing wounded off going to field hospitals that have been entirely reorganized and are much more efficient, take better care of these soldiers. Um, there, some of these hospitals are going to be right on the Monocacy battlefield. Um, many of those buildings are, some of those are still standing today. Uh, and many of the buildings in Frederick uh, were used as hospitals after the Battle of Antietam in 1862, after the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, and are going to be used again after the Battle of Monocacy in 1864. So in the Frederick community, which of course the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is located in the community of Frederick, they are no strangers to battlefield medicine. they are no strangers to the Letterman system. They were there when the Letterman plan in 1862 was first utilized and showed that it could save thousands of lives on the battlefield. Again, Frederick is going to become a part of this medical story but they're also going to be part of the military story. And the Battle of Monocacy is going to really be the closest 
that full-scale combat is going to come to the city of Frederick on July 9th, 1864. So we'll get to the medical aftermath uh, after the Battle of Monocacy, but I want Ryan to take us through the Battle of Monocacy, uh, talk a little bit about it. I, I may have some questions for you. If you have any questions in the comments section, uh, Ryan is the person to ask. He is, uh, he is our, well, I, I call him, he's my resident expert on the Battle of Monocacy. Um, and, and don't call it Monocacy Creek, it is Monocacy River. Um, this is a whole debate, whole conversation going on um, between some of our friends, uh, Monocacy River. Um, but Ryan, please take it away and uh, take us through the Battle of Monocacy. Okay, uh, we'll try to make this uh, pretty quick because no one wants to be here for three hours, right? Um, but let me go back to my maps here. So what we have here is the situation on the morning of July 9th, 1864, again, which is the day of the battle. You can see, if you follow my mouse again, the winding Monocacy River and uh, go back. The winding Monocacy River, which Lou Wallace and his 6,500 or so Union soldiers have fallen behind. Erastus B. Tyler on the north uh, side of the battlefield is the one with the Ohio National Guards and some of those Maryland Ho Potomac Home Brigade soldiers. Wallace's more experienced soldiers belong to the 3rd Division of the 6th Army Corps, uh, James B. Ricketts, two brigades of soldiers who have been fighting. The map keeps uh, running back and forth. So here we go. Uh, two brigades who have been fighting at, at Wilderness and over the, throughout the North, um, Overland Campaign. And then you've got Jubal Early's Divisions. He's had three divisions of infantry coming towards Lou Wallace. Robert Emmett Rhodes towards Ross Tyler, Stephen Dodson Ramser uh, towards Monocacy Junction, and then eventually John Brown Gordon. And Wallace's intentions are to hold three pretty pivotal bridges. Tyler is guarding a stone bridge, which leads the, the road towards Baltimore. And then Ricketts is in charge of two bridges on the southern side of the battlefield, an iron railroad bridge, uh, on over which the Baltimore and Ohio River uh, Railroad crosses, and the Covered Bridge. The Covered Bridge is right here, and that is the road to Washington. From the battlefield, Mono uh, Washington is about 50 miles, give or take, uh, straight into Washington. And so Wallace's intentions are to guard those uh, three bridges. And fighting is going to start really in earnest around 9.30 in the morning, with Confederates deploying skirmishers at the Stone Bridge, the Monocacy Junction, and then eventually down here. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. And skirmishing will continue throughout the morning. Confederates who have the numerical advantage, remember about 15,000 soldiers to Wallace's 6,500, are going to be marshaling their forces. Early himself is not on the battlefield. He's in Frederick City, ransoming and negotiating with the town leaders for money, uh, which will leave the battlefield control to these three division commanders. Confederate forces will attempt uh, to send one brigade of dismounted cavalry under the command of a man named John McClausland over the what's called the Worthington McKinney Ford right down here. And McClausland's intention is to wrap up the Union flank. McClausland and his Confederates do not know that there are six Corps veterans on the field. They're going to get a rude awakening when they get to the Worthington house and then they advance towards the Thomas farm uh, and are met by withering musketry fire. And I mentioned a few moments ago, Glenn Worthington. Glenn Worthington is one of the best primary source accounts of the battle. He's six years old. He's watching the fight from the family basement. Uh, and then about 70-ish later, he, he writes an account called Fighting for Time. And so we've got all of these very good primary source accounts from Worthington. Um, he says when the Union soldiers first opened fire, it was the ground opened up and swallowed McClausland's Confederates. So many of them fell. Uh, the fire is absolutely murderous. McClausland falls back. He tries again. He's beaten back a second time. So Ricketts is doing his job. He's holding the line, as is Erastus Tyler and his Ohioans and Marylanders. They're also holding the line. And fighting will again continue throughout the afternoon. The tipping point really comes in the afternoon. Um, you'll notice we're, we've just kind of zoomed in on the, the Worthington Thomas Farm section of the battlefield. And around 3.30 in the afternoon, John Brown Gordon's three brigades of infantry arrive on the field. Clement Evans commands a brigade of very experienced Georgians. Zebulon York commands what is left of the brigade known as the Louisiana Tigers. And uh, William Terry commands what's left of the Stonewall Brigade. So these very famous Confederate units that have seen some of the hardest fighting of the entire Civil War are now being tasked with breaking the, with the Union line. And the next 90 minutes from 3.30 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 
we'll see nearly 2,000 casualties. The entire battle as a whole sees about 2,200 casualties. So in those 90 minutes, 2,000 men are killed or wounded or missing. The fighting is extremely vicious around the Thomas Farm, uh, which still exists today to this day. Both the Worthington and Thomas Farm still both exist. And the fields around Christian Keeper Thomas's farm uh, are covered in bodies and, and blood, and, and it's very graphic. Um, Gordon's own brother is wounded. His horse is killed. Clement Evans is shot in the chest. He goes down. Uh, and so the fighting is a stand-up, knockdown brawl. When it comes to 1864, we think about fighting in trenches and, and slow, methodical advances. But here at Monocacy, it is a stand-up, knockdown brawl between members of the 6th Army Corps and John B. Gordon's veterans. But Ricketts' men have been fighting all day. They're running low on ammunition. They've suffered heavy casualties fighting against McClausen's Virginians. And so by about 5 o'clock, Ricketts' line breaks, uh, and it will retreat off of the battlefield. Tyler's men, again to the north, hold the line long enough, and then they fall back around 6 o'clock. Over the entire day, like I mentioned, about 2,200 casualties. 1,200 are, are United States casualties, killed, wounded, and, and captured. And about a thousand Confederates are captured, or, or killed or wounded, excuse me. Um, Gordon suffered 700 of the 1,000 total losses uh, on Confederate side. So again, you get an idea of just what happened at the Thomas Farm. And you were saying a couple of minutes ago, Jake, that these field hospitals are on the battlefield. The Worthington House becomes a field hospital for Confederate forces. The Gambrel Mill becomes a field hospital for Union soldiers. Uh, and so as these soldiers are fighting, they, they're being dragged just a couple hundred yards to be tended to by surgeons um, and treated. And again, pretty graphic accounts are left in the wake of the battle. But the, the key moment here is, did Lew Wallace lose? Yes. Uh, but it becomes known as the battle that saved Washington because it delays early in his advance. And we'll talk more about the repercussions of the campaign, I, I presume, later. But that's the battle in a nutshell. Uh, a very quick and abbreviated version of the story, but the the crux of the fighting is done um, around the Thomas and Worthington Farm fields in the afternoon of July 9th, 1864. Two medals of, uh, of honor are awarded during the battle. Uh, one to Alexander Scott here for uh, saving the flags of the 10th Vermont Infantry, and one here uh, to a man named Captain Davis who escorts his picket line to safety. So there are stories of heroism, bravery, gallantry, on this battlefield, but I think we'll leave it there. Uh, yes, if you would uh, just quick go back to the uh, to your other map that shows a little sure. bit wider, a little bit of a yeah. wider view. Yeah, so I do want to do just want to point out that this is like I, I mentioned before, this is the closest battle that is going to take place to downtown Frederick to the to the museum uh, where we are at right in downtown. It's actually on this map along the Baltimore Pike, right in right in uh, in Frederick, about three miles south of town. Um, and I'll, I'll, Ryan, I'll come ask you to come back to this map, but we do have some good questions okay. here. So if you want to uh, take us off screen share for just a sec, sure. so I can see those. All right, so two good questions from the, uh, from the audience so far. If you do have any other questions for Ryan, please ask away uh, in the comments section. We are happy to get to any and all questions uh, that, that we get in the comments. Uh, so the first one comes from Derek, um, Derek Rupert. Derek, thank you for watching these videos. Thanks for always being here and commenting. Uh, he asks, what involvement did African-Americans play at Monocacy? So during the battle, there are no United States colored troops or, or black soldiers. But we know historically from studies done by people like Kevin Levin that the Confederate Army is full of enslaved people in the camp, which are tending to different camps and, and horses and things like that. So while the, the soldiers are going forward to fight, um, blacks and enslaved are left behind to tend to, uh, again, the horses and wagons and things like that. On the Union side, same thing that had happened in, in 1863 at places like Gettysburg. When, when African Americans found out that the Confederate Army was coming to town, they fled uh, because they'd heard stories of the previous summer of, of blacks being kidnapped and captured back into slavery. While it's a tangential story, at the Monocacy Junction, there was a recruiting depot later in 1864 for the United States Colored Troops. And so um, Marylanders who were joining the United States Colored Troops, some of them were mobilized at the Monocacy Junction and sent on to the, to, sent to the front. But during the battle, again, no involvement of United States Colored Troops or anything like that. 
All right, thank you, Ryan. I will say that there is, um, Derek, you do mention about uh, reading a placard at Monocacy about African Americans. Uh, that is a placard, a, a wayside marker that is very close to Monocacy Junction where the railroad uh, makes a turn and swings over the Monocacy River that talks about, as Ryan just mentioned, the USCT recruiting station that was located at Monocacy. And if you look at USCT soldier records, just to, to add a little bit on to, to what Ryan already said, you'll oftentimes see Maryland USCT troops. Uh, they were joined, they joined the US Army at Monocacy Junction. So it is a crucial part, although like Ryan said, not from the battle, uh, not involved in the battle itself. Uh, the other question um, that I wanna ask you right now, Ryan, is from Wayne Waite. This is a great question. Thank you, Wayne, for, for weighing in tonight. Uh, he asks, where was the 106th New York located at the Thomas Farm? My great grand uncle was wounded and taken to hospital number one, Hessian Barracks, with a groin wound. He died about 20 days later. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the 106 New York? Yeah. So let me go back to my map. So let's see here. 106 New York, again, part of Ricketts Division. Uh, they're going to be engaged throughout the day fighting different elements of Confederate forces, both McClausland's Cavalry Brigade and then Gordon's um, Division of Infantry. So if we go forward uh, just a little bit, you'll see them fighting uh, around and towards the middle of the line. If you look on the battlefield, you'll note that the 10th Vermont held the far left, which is why they have a monument today. Um, the, the, the 106th New York will be for, further towards the middle of the Union line. Uh, but they, like other units, suffer extremely heavy casualties, uh, and they, they will hold not only against McClausen's two cavalry attack, but also, again, that 90-minute uh, stand-up knockdown brawl that takes place between Gordon and um, Ricketts' men. If you have Gordon's attack going forward, let me pull up the different map here. Let me pull up the different map. Um, you'll see that 106 New York will be more towards the middle, like I was saying a couple of minutes ago, right around here. Uh, when they get pushed off the battlefield, they're going to retreat back towards the Stone Bridge. Without going back to my files, can't go into many more specifics than that, but hopefully that will give just enough to know if you go to Monocacy today, you'll be towards the center of the Union line right here. The Thomas Farm today is the administrative headquarters for the park. My cat is here to say hello. Um, so yeah. we'll, put, we'll put her down. Um, so if you go to the Monocacy battlefield today, the, the Thomas Farm is the administrative headquarters, so there are some trails around there. Uh, and you can walk around. Uh, if I'm being intentionally vague, I apologize. But again, without going to my files, I can't go into many more details than that. No, that is that is great, Ryan. And, and Wayne, thanks for asking that question. Um, we are happy to, you know, if you want to share more about your grandfather's story, please uh, drop some more information in the comments. I'll, I'll put my email in there as well if you'd like to email me um, with that information. We always love sharing those kinds of stories on our page on our blog. Uh, that sounds like a, a good one with a, a great connection uh, to the museum. You also mentioned in that comment the General Hospital number one in, in Frederick. And so this is a good this is a good spot for us to go into the medical component of the Battle of Monocacy and what happens in the aftermath. As Ryan mentioned, there's going to be battlefield hospitals out there. And if, Ryan, if you would bring up the bring up the map again. Sure. Thank you. Go back to these maps. Here you go. All right. Yes. Yeah, so if we look at our, our battlefield map here, these farms that are scattered around, uh, Worthington Farm specifically, Thomas Farm, these, these places are going to, uh, and, and the fields around them are going to become battlefield hospitals in the wake of this battle. Very quickly though, within a day, two days, those wounded are going to be retri uh, retrieved from these hospitals and as was common procedure, they're going to be moved to the nearest permanent medical facility, which, because this battle takes place on the outskirts of Frederick, the wounded are actually very fortunate from this battle. Uh, in other battles that we talk about in this region, Gettysburg, we talk about Antietam, they are miles from permanent military medical structures and facilities. At Antietam, the closest one is Frederick. At Gettysburg, the large, real main Union Army hospitals that were constructed for medical purposes are in Philadelphia. There's some in York as well, um, ended up into Harrisburg. 
They're miles and miles away, painful wagon rides, hospital or ambulance rides, and by trains, miles and miles away. Ryan, if you could go to your other map here. Sure. Let me see. There you go. Excellent. For Frederick, for those wounded on the outskirts of Frederick during the Battle of Monocacy on July 9th, 1864, their hospital, their nearest hospital facility, with 2,500 to 3,000 beds available, and most of them were available when this battle takes place, is right there where uh, the Eccles, um, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is that right? Eccles? Yeah, yep. Eccles. Um, and Mount Olivet Cemetery, right essentially um, where Ryan is pointing is the Hessian Barracks was a military facility that dated back to the American Revolution, served as a prison camp during the American Revolution. That's where it got its name, the Hessian Barracks. There were Hessian soldiers, prisoners of war, and their families that were uh, held there during the American Revolution. It's used during the War of 1812. It's two very large stone buildings. Then when the Civil War breaks out, it becomes uh, it's on the fairgrounds for Frederick County. The Frederick, Frederick Agricultural Fairgrounds were located there. So there's a large parade ground outside of these two large stone barracks buildings. And as the war goes on, and Frederick, because Frederick was crucial, you can actually see from this map why Frederick is so crucial. And it's what brings armies to Frederick in 1862, 63, and 64. The Georgetown Pike, which you see cutting across this map, goes south to Washington, D.C., and goes north towards Gettysburg. The other main road you see on this map is the Baltimore Pike, which is the modern day, uh, what is known as the National Road. Goes east to Baltimore, goes west, uh, over the uh, Catoctin and South Mountain ranges, out towards Antietam, Hagerstown, and then further west towards the Alleghenies. So Frederick is at this crucial crossroads. It's what brings these armies here in 1864. Um, and like I said, brings the armies here in years prior. It also means it's a perfect spot for a military hospital. And so on the grounds of the Hessian Barracks and the Frederick Agricultural Fairgrounds, Union, U.S. Army, medical authorities construct a large hospital at that site. And so they have around 3,000 beds available there. Uh, over a dozen hospital wards were constructed in addition to the two stone buildings that were already pre-existing. And so these beds are available after Antietam, after Gettysburg, and then after Monocacy. And so most of the wounded who are going to be uh, picked up from the battlefield that Ryan talked about, this vicious fight on the banks of the Monocacy River, are going to be brought three miles to the hospital, uh, General Hospital Number 1 at the Hessian Barracks in Frederick. Now, a big difference, um, which is, I think is, is pretty interesting compared to 1862, and this gets to the progression of, of where military medicine has gone over these uh, over the years, up to 1864, uh, and also gets to the, to the relatively small scale of this particular battle. So because of the efficiency of the military evacuation system and the fact that there is hospital space available and they now have the ability to, very similar to what's going on now uh, during the pandemic, the idea of you can surge, you, can, uh, you have outdoor tent space available, you can bring in more medical authorities uh, and, and officials to take care of your wounded. We're seeing that at this battle. You're going to bring all of your wounded from Monocacy into this pre-existing hospital structure. They're going to take care of the wounded, uh, and they're going to do it much more efficiently, and in this case, quickly, than you would have seen in previous battles. And to get to the small scale, because there are only, what, what is it, 2,200 casualties, Ryan? Yeah, total, both sides, yep. So you have a relatively, compared to an Antietam or a Gettysburg, this is a small scale engagement. And that means that those casualties can fit into that hospital for the most part, which is different than from Antietam, uh, when the city of Frederick received 8,000 to 10,000 wounded soldiers and nearly every church, school, public building is turned into a hospital. From Monocacy, we don't see that because you have the bed space available at the hospital uh, right there. I do want to read just a quick account. Um, I love this guy in Frederick, and I know uh, Ryan enjoys him too. And uh, his name is Jacob Engelbrecht, and he has many opinions, many, many opinions. He was a nosy, nosy tailor who lived in Frederick during the Civil War and 
through most of the 19th century and kept a very detailed diary about it. So if you want to, uh, do you want to get, uh, you know, a, an idea of what life was like in Frederick through the eyes of Jacob Engelbrecht, the diary is available through the Historical Society or Heritage Frederick as it is called now. Um, but he does have a good diary entry here that I'll kind of conclude with and then I'm gonna throw it back to Ryan for consequences of this campaign. Um, but this is what Engelbrecht describes at that hospital, at US General Hospital number one, uh, in the days after the Battle of Monocacy. This is what he writes, says, quote, at the barracks yesterday, I saw at least 500 rebel wounded and also, of course, prisoners. This is what he, that's what he wrote on July 12th. This is three days after the battle. It says, quote, many had am limbs amputated. I saw one operation of the, uh, of the amputation of the left leg of a Union soldier by Dr. Weir of the United States Hospital. It took about 20 minutes. So thankfully, uh, Jacob Engelbrecht, nosy guy, is going into the hospital in the aftermath of Monocacy and describing some of the scenes. And there is more of these scenes that are included in Ryan's book as well if you want to go to the primary documents. Again, the Engelbrecht Diary is held by the Heritage Frederick, his former Historical Society of Frederick County. So that brings a conclusion to my medical aftermath of Monocacy. If you wanna jump off the screen there, Ryan, I'll see if we have any other questions or comments here. Thank you all for, for commenting and throwing in your comments here. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay, here's a question. Um, this is gonna be hard for us, Ryan, because math isn't always our strong suit. At least it's not mine. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mischaracterizing your. You have a secret passion for mathematics, but okay. Um, what was uh, the the percentage of the Confederate force that was lost at Monocacy as casualties? Okay, uh, and fear not, but my math skills. I took the SATs twice, and my math score went down the second time. So, <laughs> um, so early brings about fifteen thousand Confederates to bear, give or take a few at Monocacy. The bulk of the fighting is going to be carried by John Brown Gordon's division. And I mentioned earlier, they suffer around 700 casualties. Of the 15,000 total, Early loses about 1,000 men killed and wounded. Um, very few captured because Wallace's men are streaming in retreat toward Baltimore. Uh, but you look at those casualties being mostly in Gordon's division, 700 of them, it means that he's going to be pretty much useless in the coming days when Early tries to make his push on Washington. Robert Rhodes' division loses very minimal. Uh, we're talking like 20 or 30 in my estimation. Uh, Ramser loses a few more, maybe about 50. And the remaining 100 or so are, are taken in by McClausland's Cavalry Brigade. Uh, John Eccles' division doesn't fire a single shot during the battle. They spend the entire battle in reserve at Mount Olivet Cemetery, uh, only being moved up at the very end when there was no fighting to be done. So of, of Early's 15,000 total, he loses about 1,000 men um, in the fight. Uh, and how big and this is this goes back to the kind of putting monocacy in this bigger bigger campaign and bigger kind of war effort in the eastern theater how big uh how much of a how much of lee's army is, is early taking away from petersburg and bringing to to monocacy so by the time lee's at petersburg he's going to send about a quarter uh, well, he's not, he's not at Petersburg quite yet. He's still at Cold Harbor. Um, he sends about a quarter of his infantry with Early. Early will pick up a few more units in the Shenandoah Valley, um, but he's, he's, taken about a, he's taking about 25% of Lee's available infantry north to, uh, to Maryland. He's leaving behind, that will leave behind uh, elements of James Longstreet's first corps and A.P. Hill's third corps to stay in Petersburg. Uh, but in terms of numbers, he's taking about a, a quarter with him uh, to Maryland. So I, I, it always astounds me just how much of a of a risk this must have been to 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 do this. But I think for the the to get to kind of our next stage of the program tonight, you know, talking about the the greater you know what happens after Monocacy and, and the importance of this campaign the possible risk reward here is is pretty substantial considering that you know we don't have steve fan with us tonight but uh the civil war forts of washington are pretty much empty at this point right yeah absolutely 
Uh, and that's always my argument. People always talk about, rightfully so, that Washington by 1864 is one of the most fortified cities in the world. Absolutely. Uh, I love you, Steve. You can mention that point as much as you want. However, if there's nobody in the fort, the fort's useless. Um, there are very few available resources in Washington in the early days of July. Early's threat is scaring so many people that Montgomery Meigs, Quartermaster General of the United States Army, is arming war clerks uh, who are going through the basic numbers on how to load a musket for the very first time. Uh, the Invalid Corps, wounded soldiers on leave are going into action. Um, and so we're taking everybody and their mother into service, right? Uh, Gustavus Fox, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, orders a steamship to be constantly ready, um, if necessary, to whisk Lincoln away and the cabinet away to save them. So we look at it today, 158 years later, and we say, oh, it, was a, it was never going to work. It's useless. Why do they even do that? And we can say that with 158 years of certainty. But in 1864, there's a whole lot more uncertainty going on, and it's going to be, remain uncertain until reinforcements arrive from Washington and from the Gulf of Mexico, the 19th Corps have been sent to solidify the line. Uh, and so there's a lot of uncertainty in Washington in those early days of July 1864. Jubal Early had also been instructed by Robert E. Lee to attempt to secure prisoners of war from Point Lookout in Maryland. That plan fizzles before it even really gets underway. It's too much, too far. Uh, so early, early is asked to do a lot with a little bit, and to his credit, and that's not saying, you know, I'll, I'll be the last one to give early credit for much, but to his credit, he makes it pretty close. Uh, he gets outside of Washington, uh, he can see the Capitol building, and it's, a, it's closer than we give him credit for. So yeah, there's going to be fighting right, I'm, I'm a, living in Washington, D.C. now, so it's going to result in some fighting right here in the District of Columbia. They're going to get very, very close. And, and this is, you know, the Battle of Fort Stevens, which is the inevitable result of this campaign, is in part a medical story because, as, as Ryan mentioned, the, the clerks as well as Invalid Corps members, the, as this time already renamed the Veteran Reserve Corps because Invalid was pretty much an insult uh, to, to those men uh, in the 1860s, calling somebody an invalid was you know, basically an insult uh, to, to their manhood, to their personhood. And so Veteran Reserve Corps units are soldiers who had been admitted to hospitals either for uh, chronic disease, uh, for war injuries, and they could not go back to full-time service with their units. And so they're going to be uh, VRC units, Veteran Reserve Corps units, in Washington uh, and in the surrounding areas who are going to be helping to staff the hospitals. They're going to be guarding key spots. Um, they're going to be participating in the defense of, of Washington while most of the able-bodied men are off in the fighting. And so when early, I'm, I'm always just thinking of these scenes must have been, I, I hesitate to say laughable, but it must have been pretty humorous to see some of these guys because there was a reason they're in the VRC and they're not back with their units. And that means they're, they're hobbling around. These guys have chronic diarrhea. I mean, they're going to the bathroom every 20 minutes, uh, especially while trying to go out on campaign, you know, go out and demand the defenses. They're going to have to use the bathroom every 20 minutes. This is, these are not the men you want to defend the union capital. but up until Grant sends troops in, they're all, that Lincoln and the Union government has in D.C. To, to defend the city. I just think that is astounding. And, and in hindsight, we look back and say, like you said, Ryan, that, you know, oh, like early never really stood a chance. But when you look at it and you go and look at it the way that you did, Ryan, they had a really, they had a real shot. Absolutely. And to be clear, I don't believe that early can take the city and hold the city. Uh, but I think if we take a step back and think of the political repercussions, the political repercussions, again, remember it's July, Lincoln's up for re-election in November. What is the political consequence of early staying in Washington long enough to raise the Confederate battle flag above the Capitol building or raise the Confederate battle flag above the White House? Is he going to stay in Washington? No, I think we can agree on that. But again, the political consequences of even taking Washington for a day, half a day, are, are more than we give credit for. Again, uh, as far as late as August uh, of 1864, Lincoln ardently believed he was going to lose the campaign, the presidential campaign. Uh, and so there are a lot of factors at play that we don't necessarily think about from the safety of 158 years later. 
so with all that being said, and we're about 45 minutes in here, so we're going to start wrapping up. I think, you know, what I'm really curious as to, as to how, and this is going to go more to the personal side, Ryan, how, how did you get interested in this battle and, and why do you think it's important? Yeah, so I kind of alluded to this at, at the front of the talk, um, reading Glenn Worthington's book when I was an intern, um, and, and, and finding a battlefield that had books about it, absolutely, but wasn't nearly, you can't fill entire bookshelves about just monocacy like you can with some other battlefields that will remain nameless. Um, and, and so the idea of talking about a battle that hasn't necessarily gotten the credit that I think it deserves was definitely a magnetizing force to send me towards researching the battlefield. Uh, the staff and the volunteers at the Monocacy National Battlefield are absolutely wonderful. Um, they helped in all sorts of ways doing research, but their enthusiasm and their love for their park absolutely comes through every single day. Uh, and the dedication that they have comes through every single day. Uh, but yeah, here, here is this wonderful resource on the inside of Frederick that, quite frankly, not very many people notice. Um, if you're going on 95, if you're on 270, um, and you're 45 minutes or so from Gettysburg, and there are people who just want to get to Gettysburg, they, they drive right by the road sign, and they, they miss this wonderfully complex, deep, personal story uh, that unfolded in, in July of 1864 along the banks of the Monocacy River. And if I can do even a, a morsel of anything to change that opinion and get people realizing that Monocacy is a place worth visiting and preserving and talking about, then I'm going to do it. Absolutely. I think well, well said. I have to say, you know, the, it, to, to reaffirm what you have said there and, and just say, if, you, if you're coming to Frederick, and you're visiting the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, which I hope you do. Please do. Please come visit us. We would love to see you. Uh, or you're going to Gettysburg. You're going to Antietam, Harper's Ferry. You are so close to Monocacy. Please go visit. And not only because of the Battle of Monocacy, which Ryan talked about tonight and, and did such an eloquent job of describing what happened and succinctly describing what happened. But this is a place with centuries of stories uh, that are there that, that date back to, you know, the American Revolution, the aftermath of the revolution, you know, a big part of this battlefield that is, that was a battleground in July of 1864 was a pretty brutal plantation in the in the early the late part of the 18th century and early part of the 19th century you can learn about that story you can learn about the usct station and and at monocacy junction you can learn about railroad history because the baltimore and ohio railroad cuts right through this battlefield and and it the bridge actually plays a, a pretty pretty important part in the story also it features uh in the cover of Ryan's book. You can see the, well done. Uh, well done. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's so many layers of history at this one location, not to mention, of course, 1862 and the uh, Special Orders 191 being lost somewhere in the vicinity of this battlefield and, and played a, a crucial role in the Antietam campaign. So this is a place you got to go visit. You got to go pick up this book. Again, you can find the link uh, and the uh, the email address for our store manager, if you'd like to purchase this wonderful book from us, uh, you can do so by going and emailing Trish Flora. She's our store manager at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Well, Ryan, I want to say thank you so much for, for coming on with us this evening. Absolutely, Jake. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. And thank you all out there for tuning in with us this evening. If you are enjoying these videos, please go on to civilwarmed.org support. That link is in the comment thread as well. Become a donor, become a, a member, support the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And also, you are, it is able, it's possible for you to come visit us. Uh, we are open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. You can find information about coming to visit us and the, uh, our COVID preparation plans and uh, what you need to know to come visit. You can go to civilwarmed.org. You can see posts on our Facebook page as well. We hope to see you at the museum or for our next live video, which will be on Wednesday evening. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Uh, I hope this video tonight has been a, a good way to start your, your week uh, with a Monday night program. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thanks everyone.